and thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Logistics with Purpose presented by Vector Global Logistics and Supply Chain Now. We are delighted to have another amazing conversation for you today with someone else doing good in the world and who has a fascinating perfect personal story that you'll love hearing. Um, but before we get to him, let me introduce my fearless co-host today, Monica Roche. Moni, how are you? Hi, Christy. So happy to be here. How about you? I'm delighted that you're here with me. It's been a while since we co-hosted together, so I'm glad to be um, back in the saddle with you. And we've already had such an amazing pre-conversation with our guest today, so I know it's going to be a good one for listeners. Definitely. So... Now we're going to welcome Eric Aparicio. Uh, he's the Senior Director and Strategic Marketing at Yamaha Corporation of America. So welcome, Eric. Thanks for being here. Hello and good morning, and thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. We're thrilled to have you joining us. We're, of course, excited to know more about Yamaha and perhaps some things that we weren't aware of um, for such a well-recognized company. But before we talk about that, um, tell us a little bit about your childhood and where you grew up. I know from our pre-conversation before we started recording, you're very interested in family history and legacy and preservation. So tell us more about you and um, how you got your start in life. Well, um, I, was, I was born in East LA and uh, my, my parents, when I was very young, uh, they bought their first home in a suburb on the outskirts of LA County called La Fuente. And that's where I grew up. It was uh, it was a nice working class neighborhood, and um, you know I I don't know that I have any particular stories about that that I can share that shaped who I am. But I would have to say that you know my my parents specifically my father dramatically shaped who I am and and, and my childhood. You know I was uh, very fortunate to grow up with great parents. And uh, they instilled with me, both of them, a very strong work ethic, you know, and uh, growing up in the in the 60s and the 70s, you know, you, you know, times were different. And so you, you grew up with a lot of resilience and a lot of grit. And uh, in my, in my father's home, there was no giving up and there was no backing up. There's only one direction and it's forward. Wow. That's great. And and <laughs> it's very interesting to know that about you and your father. And uh, you just mentioned that there's not a specific, a specific story about uh, your childhood that you could share, but maybe while you were growing up, there was another person that was like a mentor for you or that helped you to develop your career. Uh, what would be that person? That person would be my maternal grandmother. Mm. Uh, my uh, her husband uh, died b before I was born, mm -hmm. and she had nine children. Yeah. And I, I just as a as a middle aged man now, I, I you know the the idea of a parent, any parent, raising a family that large alone. I think, oh my God, what what kind of strength and grit and sacrifice does that take? And so my my grandmother was. She was a tough woman, you know, and uh, and she definitely made me tough. Going over to grandma's house, it wasn't fun and games. She always put me to work every time I came over. There was something that always needed to be done, you know, and uh, she was a very powerful influence on my life. And before we started recording, you and I were talking about money was kind of asking questions as well. I'd love for you to also share on the record here just about the researching of your family history and finding out that you had a crest and talking to your younger family members and what that means and kind of how to tie your past to your to your future. I love that you've certainly done a lot more research than I have on it, but I'm curious just to, I would love to have our listeners hear your perspective on that. Well, you know, I think it's um, important to always understand where you've been so that it can help you determine where you want to go you know and I think it's so important in life for all of us to be our true authentic selves whatever that is you know um, and so for the idea of researching my family name and where we came from to to get to this point <clears throat> I felt was important to leave a story behind 
mm. for my children, my nieces, my nephews, my other cousins, my second cousins, mm. just to understand that there's a path. And when you know where you start, well, then you can, you can feel good about wh where you are. And maybe it also, you know, creates some, some inspiration to, to drive, to get to a point, you know, to, to pass the, the baton a little bit further th than where you got it from. And I think that's a, that's a fundamental concept for, for parents and for grandparents. Yeah, I agree. Um, thank you for sharing that. And speaking of looking back, uh, before we jump into your career, I'm also curious, you've been with Yamaha for a long time, which we'll talk about now. And so as you kind of started your career and looking back on that, um, what would you tell your 21 year old self or, or your self who's just getting started in their professional career? What, what valuable lessons have you learned in the last couple of decades that you would want that person to know? <clears throat> wow. <laughs> I don't know what I would think talking to a 20 year old version of myself, but <laughs> I would, the first thought that comes to mind is focus, mm. right? Focus, focus on what's most important to you and keep that focus until you attain what, what you want, what you were striving for, <clears throat> you know, cause um, so much about life is that singular focus, mm -hmm. you know, and when you, when, when you don't have a plan, well, then you have to take whatever life gives you. But when you have a plan, you're, you're more likely to get what you want out of life. Yeah, for sure. I would agree. That makes perfect sense. And I didn't really get as focused as I am now until, until I got married, which was at 25. So 21-year-old mm -hmm. uh, Eric was, was still <laughs> kind of a knucklehead. <laughs> well, well you've come a long way. And I can still get that advice, like, yes, yeah, focus. And I think it's a great advice, no matter what old people are. It's mm -hmm. something yep. to keep in mind, like, always. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's, speaking of, let's talk about your professional career a little bit, which has been almost exclusively at Yamaha, which is amazing in and of itself when so many people change careers these days. So tell us more about your experience and career path within the company. Um, well, well, let me start about with my employer before going to Yamaha. Let's do because, it, yeah. Um, I used to work for a small retailer in Orange County, and um, I think about them with nostalgia mm -hmm. because it's where I cut my teeth and what's it, and it's where I, I I learned so much about business. But yet, as I look back on that experience, I don't think that I could ever work there again or any place like it. Because, you know, our only mission was to make the owners more money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't have a vision, a purpose, company values. And when I came to Yamaha, I mean, that's, that's what drives Yamaha. And, and the company's, you know, vision and values and, and philosophy very much aligned with my own. Yeah. And so, you know, generally speaking, most people have to work to support ourselves and work is good for us. But when, when you can derive satisfaction and be content with the work that you're producing and that you feel that it adds value to, to others or, or to society at large, your work becomes more meaningful and, and, and much less stressful and it becomes something that, that adds balance to your life. And that's what I have found at Yamaha. And it's, it's a big reason why I'm still there. Thanks for sharing that with us. And it's very nice that you really care for what the company does and that it aligns with your personal values. Because like you mentioned, it's what keeps you there. But I'm also curious about what drew you to Yamaha in the first place. Like, mm -hmm. I understand why you are there now, why you're keeping there, but why Yamaha, I mean, first of all? Well, you know, there's there's a a lot of people that work at Yamaha that have really cool stories because they they were into music and mm -hmm. you know they they absolutely wanted to work at Yamaha, but <clears throat> mine is not like that. Um, the uh, the the company that I was working for began to run into some some challenges, and I thought it was time to make a change, mm -hmm. and so um, I had 
a mentor at, at that time. His name was Brian Jamillion. And uh, Brian had just um, switched to, to work at Yamaha. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brian knew that I was looking to make a change. And I trusted him very, very much. And so he asked me to come work for him at Yamaha, which I did. And so that's how I ended up at Yamaha. <clears throat> The best jobs always come through friends um, and people Absolutely. you trust as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And so what have been some of the roles that you've held within Yamaha during uh, your time with them? Well, um, uh, Yamaha used to be structured um, with a process-driven type of divisional structure mm -hmm. where you had these semi-autonomous business units which all contained <clears throat> uh, duplicative functions like order entry, tech support, marketing, sales, inventory. And so uh, I was the uh, administration director for those and I was responsible for managing uh, those, those departments within that sales and marketing division. And um, I was fortunate enough to uh, move into multiple divisions so that you know, I had a much better grasp and understanding of, of what Yamaha is uh, from multiple product perspectives, uh, right. uh, multiple product lines and different types of industries and business channels. And it really gave me a very broad view of the value of the Yamaha name and brand. Mm -hmm. And so is the process, you mentioned that they used to have a, the, a process of how they were structured. How did that change? Uh, it changed uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, our president, uh, Tom Sumner, um, restructured our, our company to be a functional driven company. So instead of having these uh, semi-autonomous business units that really didn't collaborate a ton, <clears throat> um, all of those divisions were, were eliminated. And instead we created functional groups so now we have one massive marketing group, one massive sales group, one massive inventory group. And it's so it basically aligned uh, positions and su subject matter expertise by function. Oh. <clears throat> it's very interesting. So since you have been there like for around two decades now, and you have seen the industry in general change a lot, not only inside the company, but also around it. So what are other of the of the ships that you have experienced in the industry, not only inside the company, but outside? What have what can you tell us about that? I think the industry has become much better at storytelling. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, that's what we aim to do in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the areas where Yamaha ha ha has struggled. We tend to be a very product-centric company. And so we, we talk a lot about, about features and specifications and, you know, that, that only goes so far. Right. And, um, you know, I, I want to reference one of my favorite TED Talks. I, I, I love TED Talks. <laughs> we love and, them uh, too. and my favorite is The Golden Circle by Simon Sinek. Yes. Where... He talks about the why, right? People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. And within Yamaha, um, as a result of this, uh, of this new structural organization driven by function, our marketing teams are now better, they're, they're in a much better position mm -hmm. to engage in storytelling and engage in storytelling across the organization mm -hmm. instead of focusing so much on, on very product-centric marketing. And so that's one of the biggest changes that, that I can see in, in a positive way for Yamaha and for the industry is that we've become much better at storytelling. And yes. that's just great. Uh, I wanna say something, uh, not exactly about Yamaha, but about what you were telling. Uh, Chris is our head of marketing and sales, and she's very into storytelling too. And she has shared that with me. Actually, I, I knew who Simon said it was because of her. And I've seen some, some TED Talks because of her. And 
And you are right. I think storytelling is impacting a lot different industries worldwide. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to show people what you care about, what you do, why yeah. you do what, what you yeah. do. So it's amazing to find that not only maybe in logistics, but also in music and in other industries. So it, it's just amazing to, to hear you say that. Right. Yes. Yeah. Start with why is required reading for our marketing department. <laughs> yep. That's an excellent book. And if you don't have enough time for the book, then yes, watch the TED Talk. <laughs> Start with the TED Talk, but yeah, read the book for sure. Yes. Yeah. And I'm also curious from your perspective and knowing Yamaha so well and going through all the changes with them. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. An amazing <laughs> have that too. Um, and tell us a little bit more about, we've talked about the instruments, the music, people have seen the label everywhere, but you also were very clear in talking about the mission and vision and values of Yamaha. So how would you describe the mission? And is there anything about Yamaha that maybe you, you wish more people would know that they don't know? Well, our vision is a world filled with music lovers inspired and enabled by Yamaha. Mm. And uh, our philosophy is about sharing passion and performance. And our, our, our primary purpose is to empower expression, mm. right? Because, you know, we're not all robots. We're all different, unique individuals. And we all have, you know, a different voice. Mm -hmm. And so certainly one way that we can express ourselves is through our music. Mm -hmm. In the way that we play, the what what we listen to. I mean, it, it's music is just such a great, wonderful thing. Even if you don't play, you can still value music. And you know, so many people can can identify points in their lives by the music that they were listening to at a certain moment, or the the music that you were listening to in college, or you know, your first dance, or that kind of thing. And so, music is such a powerful thing. And yeah, so the idea of helping others empower expression mm -hmm. is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah, I love that. I love the empowering expression. Um, that's fantastic and very repeatable <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I'm also, one of the things you're also passionate about in, within Yamaha is reverse logistics. So for those who may be unfamiliar with the term, would you define it and explain its importance in supply chain? Sure. Uh, reverse logistics is, is essentially the process whenever a consumer wants to return a product, whether you're returning it to the, re to the retailer or to the manufacturer and whatever your reason for returning it, whether it's defective or you just don't want it anymore. Reverse logistics is all about getting that product out of the consumer's hands and back to the manufacturer. And once it gets to the manufacturer, there's a significant decision matrix about what to do with that return when, when you get it back. Mm -hmm. You know, in the worst case scenario, we have some manufacturers that simply dispose of all of their products and they put them in a landfill. Uh, but uh, I, I firmly believe that a strong reverse logistics process is the backbone to any type of support a company wants to provide uh, for sustainability. Mm -hmm. So the idea that when we take back those, those returns, if we say, hey, you know, there's an opportunity to reuse this product and let's refurbish it, Let's refurbish it. And so it makes that product available for a second life mm -hmm. as long as it's made well enough so that it, it can be used to basically help somebody else that, that may not, either one, may not have the money for, uh, for that product when it was brand new, or they may be, be able to utilize that, that technology and not need the latest and greatest of everything. And, um, and certainly being able to reuse things as well. So we have a, uh, we used to have a colleague or I used to have a colleague that, that worked with us and he's since retired. His name was Dave Jewell. And Dave Jewell began working with this company who would upcycle guitars. Hmm. So rather than, rather than discard some of those guitars that were damaged and broken and beyond repair, 
Dave would work with this company um, that, where he would basically donate these damaged, broken guitars and this company would, would deliver them to artists. And the artist would basically modify, you know, the, this damaged guitar any way that they want to, paint it, restructure it, and they would create a piece of art. And so the piece of art would then be auctioned off and the proceeds would go to help whatever their local charity was. Oh, cool. And uh, if, uh, if any of your listeners want to check it out, all you have to do is Google Yamaha Cares Upcycle. Okay. And wow. uh, the... Uh, the uh, program was picked up on on several uh, local news stations here because it's such a great idea. Yeah, and this is this is just amazing, and it actually brings us to our next question. So, Eric, we know that Yamaha is also very involved in multiple societal impact efforts. Uh, would you tell us about some of them and what effect they've had on both the company and your customers? Sure. Yamaha has, has continually engaged in advocacy for music education at, in, in public schools. And uh, we have on uh, almost every year, whenever uh, we've been invited to attend, uh, we send a, a representative to Washington DC mm -hmm. to basically advocate for music and the arts as being an integral part of, of the education in a K through 12. And it's something that is really important because that, that, that idea of artistic and creative expression, it's really important to the life of a child. And mm -hmm. the, the impact on society is, is probably obvious when we think about music and the arts. But beyond that, um, Yamaha does more than, than, than talk to talk. We, we, we put our money where our mouth is. And so Yamaha supports a number of different uh, music programs throughout the US, which create the opportunity for music at the high school and, and junior high level. Mm. So um, in addition to supporting music programs, these organizations give uh, children in music programs in school an opportunity to compete and to play music. And the, the, the focus is less on competition as opposed to winner and loser. The idea of the competition is, is that everybody wants to put their best foot forward, you know, and it's not individual music competitions where, you know, you have a lead trumpeter or somebody else like that. It's, think, Think about high school band and the idea of bringing kids together to make music together. And uh, a number of these programs throughout the country, Yamaha is, is their primary sponsor. And we do that because we want, we, we want kids to have a place to play music outside of you know, football games and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so Yamaha supports this at the educational uh, level which also supports our dealers and the industry as a whole well before we um wrap up i can't let you out of the conversation as a fellow marketing professional without talking about marketing so mm -hmm. i'd love to hear you've talked about storytelling um you've talked about maybe not talking about sustainability enough but i'm curious from your perspective how the marketing message of yamaha has evolved and you know what are your challenges and solutions to those challenges for such an established company uh our, our marketing message is in the process of evolving, so it's not done yet. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, creating, getting rid of these divisions and creating functional groups has really enabled us to think about um, a, a unifying message, a, a, a cohesive branding message that, that goes out across all of our products. And it's, um, it's, it's quite difficult, even, even having all the marketing under one roof, it's quite difficult because of the breadth of Yamaha's products and the number of industries in which we, we compete. The, mm -hmm. the developing singular messaging is very difficult when you make as many products as we do. And sure. it's certainly a challenge that we're working through. Uh, but I think, I, I think the best changes have been 
um, our focus away from focusing on specifications and features and really talking about the impact of products and really, really beginning to come out of our shell and, and talk about who we are as a brand, what our personality is and what our philosophy is and how we view the world. Mm -hmm. Once again, it goes back to an emphasis on focusing on the why instead of yeah. the what. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. And go ahead, Moni. Sorry, right before we go, uh, I would like to ask you just one more question, because the other day we were talking about the phone, over the phone, sorry, and you mentioned this huge event that you love, that it's called NAM, and I've never heard about that one before, and it was just great to learn that it exists, and, and you were like, transmitting a lot of passion for that event. So if you could just share this with the audience, that would be awesome too. Sure, it's um, NAM stands for the National Association of Music Merchants. And it's the largest trade show for the musical instrument industry. And it's, uh, it's really more than a trade show. It's, um, you have to, you have to think about some of the fundamentals of music. So growing up, I was very athletic. My family valued, you know, athleticism. But in in sports, generally speaking, sports are inherently exclusive. It's a zero sum game. You know, for me to win, you have to lose. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's exclusive. I, I'm I'm not we're not collaborating together because I want to win and you don't. Um, whereas music is, is so different fundamentally because it's, it's inclusive. It's all inclusive. I mean, when, when, when musicians are, are playing th their instrument, they want to collaborate. They, they want to play their instruments with other people. And they want to know what's going on and what new things you, you're doing and a different sound. And music is inherently collaborative and inclusive. And, and because it's collaborative and inclusive, there's a vibe of, of, of connection and, and relationship. And the, the NAM trade show, because it attracts musicians from literally all over the world, it creates this really cool vibe that people are seeing long lost friends and fellow collaborators in music. And it's, 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 it's not like sports where someone's got to win and someone's got to lose. They, they just want to get together and make music and they want to talk about music and they want to be immersed in it. And it's, it's such, it's such a very cool vibe, especially if you're a musician. That's amazing. It's a beautiful sentiment and a good, uh, takeaways for life lessons as well. <laughs> sure. Um, so how can our listeners connect with you and learn more about everything that Yamaha is up to, which sounds like a lot and uh, has some great stories behind it as well. Sure. Well, uh, to to connect with me, uh, people can look at my profile on LinkedIn. That's my preferred mode of uh, social media. Uh, but, but as far as getting to know more about Yamaha, uh, Yamaha has a number of social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, most recently, uh, TikTok. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, basically connecting and following Yamaha on our social media cha channels is probably the best way to learn what's going on at Yamaha. Fantastic. Wow. Well, thanks again, Eric, for being here today with us. As always, Christy, thanks for being the best host. And <laughs> if you like to learn more about Eric or other similar stories like this, uh, make sure to listen to their next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very Eric. much.